First day, I want to thank the pastor, uh, Webster, and uh, the head elder, Gary, for giving me the privilege to uh, speak uh, something from my heart to you today. I just uh, feel at home. There's always something wonderful about coming home. In the cold Canadian winters, and they can be cold, when it's pouring with rain day after day in Vancouver, I'm dreaming about New Zealand. <laughs> I'm dreaming of the sunny days, the beautiful beaches. I'm dreaming about friends. So that the coldness and dampness and misery of Vancouver will float away as I'm falling off to sleep at night. So it's a great privilege to come back home. Uh, this is... Uh, my brother and I's home church, and by the way, he has Lawrence, a friend there, and uh, uh, June are visiting with us this morning from the Manu area. And, uh, you know, when I think of Wangarei, I think of uh, Greenfields, and think of the Webbers, and uh, think of the Fords, think of the Ring Roses. Uh, we come back from those days, and uh, it's just uh, a great privilege and great thrill to be here this morning. How many visitors have we got here today? Oh, it's very good. So we welcome you today. This is my home church. <laughs> when I leave Canada, I say, I'm going home, going home. And, uh, you know, we are going home. And so as we come to worship today, come we that love the Lord, right? Come we that love Jesus and let our joys be known. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given, right? Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the best that Jesus loves me. And we're here because of God's great love. It's all about love. All about genuine, uh, uh, heavenly God's love. And uh, every day I want to thank God for life. For glorious life that flows through my veins. I thank God for the privilege of knowing him and loving him and serving him. I thank God for the pearl of great price for Jesus and his wonderful goodness and mercy that he left heaven to come to this earth. That one day we might leave this earth and go to heaven. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? To be ready for the coming of Jesus. And by the way, that sign up there is absolutely magnificent. It's worth coming from, Van uh, from Vancouver to Wangarei to see that beautiful sign because the coming of Jesus is the blessed hope. Looking. That, that's in the continuous tense, right? Looking. Yesterday, today, and forever. Looking for the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, which is our blessed hope. Now, life is not a chance. I want you to remember this. There's no such thing as chance in the universe. Life is not a chance. Life is a choice. I have to put this on, although I don't really need it. We'll leave it for now. Life is a choice. Choose ye this day who you're going to serve, right? If God be God, serve him. If Baal be God, serve him and go to hell. That's what it means. So every day is a choice. Every day is a choice. And this choice is so important. God doesn't compel us. God doesn't force us. And it's very, very important that each one of us, young and old, have a true concept of God. Archbishop William Temple said to Christians, listen to this. He said, if you have a wrong and a false concept of God, it would be better that you were an atheist like Richard Dawkins. You think of that. God says, let a man rejoice in this, that he understands and knows me. 
Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Let a man rejoice in this. Not that he has strength or riches or brilliance on it. Let a man rejoice in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am God that exercises loving kindness and tender mercies. Do you know the truth about God? That's a life and death question. That's a very, very important question. And the God of the universe wrote a book. My brother and I were talking to one of the uh, Bible Society um, directors uh, from Shannon a couple of weeks ago. And I said to him, did God write a book? Do you think God wrote a book? He says, I don't think. He says, I know God wrote a book. <laughs> See, we don't know much about God except for this book. That's why the devil doesn't like this book. That's why the devil tries to convince you not to read this book. Read the Herald, right? Read the Advocate. But don't read this book. Because if you read this book, your life will be transformed and changed forever. The gospel is the power of God to change us. And to prepare us so that one day we can meet this great and eternal God in peace. And I'm looking forward to that day. So God wrote a book. And God tells us in this book that he has an everlasting love for each one of us. Beautiful words that Claire shared with us, right? About her experience. And her trust in God. And the Lord wants each one of us to have a personal, daily friendship so that in truth, we walk not with the world, but we walk with God, like Enoch did of old. Now, as you know, I come from the city of Vancouver, B.C. And uh, last February... This city was privileged to host the 21st Winter Olympics. Many of you saw it on television, right? Hmm. Isn't that amazing? In Canada, they had to transport snow, right? 150 kilometers. <laughs> so people from around the world could ski on Mount Cyprus. And I've been thinking about that because... Something happened to British Columbia and something happened to Vancouver when the Olympics came. Vancouver, they say, is changed forever because of those Winter Olympics two months ago. And, uh, you know, people came from all over the world. Besides the thousands and thousands of athletes who participated in those Winter Olympics. Even members of my family got on the sky train, and just went down to savor the city of Vancouver as thousands and thousands of visitors came to this unique city to participate in the Winter Olympics. Now, you may not be interested in skiing or running or anything like that, but God has indicated in his book, in this book, that he wants us to be spiritual athletes. You are not going heaven sitting down <laughs> or sitting on his premises, as someone said this morning. We're sitting on his promises. I like that. Someone said that this morning. You and I have missed the purpose of life unless we see that God is calling us to run the great race of life. Now, my brothers and I, we have always loved running. I couldn't believe it, but we're driving past where the Mungata Perry Domain and Sports Field used to be years ago. Couldn't see it. It's now a farm, I think. And uh, my brother Gary says, do you remember that day? And I was only about 12 years old, 14 years old. Do you remember that day that you ran that race? <laughs> I didn't want to remember it. Because I'd been practicing at Warakoi. Anybody know Warakoi Parity? I'd been practicing and practicing. Oh, okay. To run that race. But when I came to that race, I couldn't believe it. Something happened. My legs felt like lead. And I wasn't a great athlete. But we are called, each one of us, even if you're 90 years old, like Sister Codling told me this morning, she's 90 years old. Even if you're 90 years old, God has called you to run the race of life. And you and I today, my friends... 
we're either we're going to win heaven or we're going to win a lost eternity. And that is the choice. And God, in his great plans and purposes, and life has only meeting with God, in his great plans and purposes, has designed that each one of us run the race of life to win a crown of life and to enjoy eternity in his wonderful kingdom. God doesn't force us, but God invites us to run this great race of life. You know, at, uh, just after 10 o'clock night, last night, I went out aside and I looked up at the heavens and there were the stars, right? There was the moon, moonlight. And there were the stars and I just stood up there in awe and marveled at the brilliance of the constellations and the stars and the planets in God's great heaven. I don't understand how an intelligent person can look at the marvels of the solar system, and this is just a speck of it, and say, say there's no creator. Psalms 19 and verse 1 says, The heavens continually declare the glory of God. Does anyone say amen? Yeah. God, the heavens declare that God is the great creator. But Mr. Dawkins, Mr. Dawkins quoted in the Weekend Herald of November 7 last year, he says, it is the plain truth that we are cousins of chimpanzees. Your choice, Mr. Dawkins. More distant cousins of aardvarks, whatever they are, and mantis, whatever they are, yet more distant cousins of bananas. No wonder he's banana. And turnips continue the list as long as desired. This is a man, an Oxford scholar, Oxford uh, scientist, and he is saying publicly in New Zealand last November that he's directly related to turnips and bananas. How foolish. It's not God that's deluded, it's Mr. Dawkins that is deluded. Because everything around us is marvelous and wonderful. Sir Isaac Newton, he said, the universe exists, and that in itself is a miracle. Wow. Wonderful. And, uh, you know, he also said something else amazing. He studied the solar system, and he says, the solar system could not have come about by accident, but it is the work of a great creator. Amen. And it's your privilege and my privilege to come to know God as our creator, our redeemer, our friend, and our helper in every time of need. God is reaching out to each one of us. Yes, he is the giver of every good and perfect gift. He gives us richly all these good things we enjoy. You enjoy your family. You enjoy your friends. You enjoy your food. You enjoy your faith. These are gifts from the eternal God of the universe. And the most amazing thing of all, according to John chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Jesus, and without him nothing was made that was made. The most stupendous event in human history is the coming of Jesus to this world, says Malcolm Muggeridge. The most stupendous event is the coming of Jesus to this world. And he came to seek and to save men who are lost. The trouble with us today is the society is squeezing us into its mold. Every day, the liquor industry in New Zealand, and this was on the news three nights ago, every day, the liquor industry in New Zealand is spending $200,000 to get people to drink and ultimately to become drunkards. Isn't that tragic? 
This is not the country I grew up in. Neither is Canada, neither is Great Britain, neither is any country in the Western world. We are, we are being manipulated by, by the culture, by the society, by the musicians, by the jesters, by Hollywood. To live, to eat and to drink today, for tomorrow we die. But you and I know that God has a greater plan. God has a more glorious invitation. God has a higher uh, interest in us that we might come to life and enjoy life in all its abundance and in all its glory. So, coming back to uh, the 21st Winter Olympics, and I want you to think today of AD 55. AD 55. There's been this man, the Apostle Paul, who was devout for religion but didn't know, really know the truth about God who was changed on the way to Damascus where he was going to imprison Christians and he had a supernatural life-changing experience. And he became, as we know, the flaming evangelist of the cross, the glory of the cross and the wonders of Christ. So he's been in the old city of Athens where the Greeks were worshipping idols, right? The whole city was full of idols, including one, that says to the unknown God. The Greeks, the descendants of uh, Plato and Aristotle and these great math mathematicians, used to worship Athena, the goddess. <laughs> they used to worship the gods of the uh, Mount Olympus. And these gods were the figments of their uh, fallen natures. And these gods were imaginary gods that used to fight and squabble, and steal, and cheat, and run away with one another's partners. So Paul goes down to Athens, right? And he says, I have come to tell you the truth about the unknown God, the great creator of the universe. And some respond. But then he goes about 30 miles across the Nismus, and he comes to the, the great city of Corinth. Now, Corinth was... The land of the ancient playboys of the Middle East. Corinth was the sin city of the ancient world. At Corinth, you can walk through the ruins today. You can even see the ancient judgment seat that Paul stood before. You can look at this mountain just behind Corinth. On that mountain, they had a great temple with a thousand prostitutes. And that was the... That was the lifestyle of people coming to Corinth to seek pleasure. Live today, die tomorrow. <laughs> Have your fun and then blink your eyes and go off into eternity. And so Paul comes into the city, AD 55, and he sees young men on the streets around Corinth and they're training for the Isthmian Games. Now, the Greeks had four areas where they had Olympic Games. There was Olympia, there was Delphi, and there were the Isthmian Games and so on. And every four years, these great games were held in the area of Corinth. And so as Paul approached that city, he saw these young men out there training, right? Some to throw the discus, some to box. All, all types of activity, but most of all, to run. And uh, as he entered that city and as he shared the wonders of God's love, he touched many lives who had been influenced by the secular, sensuous culture. And these people changed. He later on told them, you Corinthians are now washed and you are cleansed, and you are God's new people. You are heirs of the kingdom. He said to them in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, Everybody in Christ is a brand new person. Old ways, old lifestyles have passed away. All things have become new. So he, he raised up there in Corinth a wonderful, wonderful group of people. And as he left that city, four years later, in 59, he wrote a letter to them. And I want you to open this letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 
<coughs> it was mentioned in our letter, uh, lesson last week, but 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And he says some very interesting things to these people. Verse 24. He says, don't you know that they which run in a race run all? He says, aren't you acquainted with the Olympic Games? The Olympic Games come from 776 BC. They were the focus of Greek life. These people were the great champions. They were the all blacks of the ancient world. They were the champions. The people taking place. And he says to the Corinthians, he says, Don't you know that the people which run in a race all run, but one receiveth the prize? And he's saying to these Corinthians believers, he says, don't you know that God intends you to run the race of life? This was the focus of so much of Greek life, was running the race in the Olympics. And so he says, you have been called out of darkness into marvelous light. You have been called... To, to run a race that you might win. So in the end, when it comes to the last day of Earth's history, either we are going to be winners or losers. And Jesus came to this world, as the way, the truth, and life, to help us to be winners. Many are going to be losers. Many are going to say to the Lord in that day, have we prophesied, have we done this and done that? And Jesus is going to say, I don't even know you. They're like this person, right, some years ago, who was in a great game. He picked up the ball. He was very sincere. He was very earnest. And he ran and he scored, but he ran in the wrong direction. And the team lost the game. Paul is saying, God has a purpose. God has a plan for us. And we are to run the great and glorious life of faith. That's what we're here for. We're not here just to enjoy ourselves. We're not here just to eat, drink, and be merry. We're not just here to en enjoy society. We're here to come to know the ultimate truth about God's purpose and God's plans for each one of us. Paul says that God from eternity has an et eternal purpose. Many people are living as if they don't think. They don't reason. They don't plan. I meet people growing older by the day, and every one of us are, and they're ending, they're approaching the end of their lives, but they seem to have no care about heaven, no care about God, no care for truth. And we're saved, the Bible says, by loving the truth. The truth as it is in Jesus. That's why the Bible says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. You cannot decide for heaven and eternity when you die. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of decision. Now is the hour of choice and opportunity. So either we just go along with the, you know, with the crowd, uh, with the culture, with the customs, or we think, what is God's plan for me? Why was I born? What am I here for? Where am I going? These are the great big questions of life. And here is the answer. So he says here, verse 25, Every man, oh, verse 24, So run that you may obtain, that you might be a winner. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now when you read, the requirements of being an athlete in Corinth or Olympia, you find that these people had to live on a very strict diet. The runners had to sign a statement that for the last 12 months or so that they had been training every day. They had to sign a statement that they had lived uh, very carefully in preparation for this great race. And Paul is saying that every person... Striver for the mastery is temperate in all things. We are balanced. 
we got to live balanced lives. Uh, my brother and I were over in the United States as young men training, Andrews University, and then we went off down into Kansas. He had a car and I had a car, and we went over those great big prairies. But one day my car nearly left the road, and I, I couldn't figure out this terrible noise and the bumping going on, but the tires were unbalanced. And Paul is saying here, you have got to live a balanced life. People say, I'm going to eat what I, like, what I like, even if it kills me. It's killing them, right? A man who's living to eat has got life out of balance. We eat to live. So we've got to have, have balance in our lives uh, regarding spiritual values, uh, regarding our relationship to the Lord, regarding our whole lifestyle. We are to live a balanced life. Now, it says here that we are to live a life of self-control. Paul wrote to the Romans, he says, don't let the world squeeze you in its, into its mold. The majority of people in our New Zealand society are allowing the, the culture to squeeze them and to set the direction of their lives. But God has a greater plan and God has a greater claim upon our hearts and our lives. He says, <clears throat> to be to practice self-control. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So these athletes training for so many m months and denying themselves sweet foods and luxuries of, of living and training, they did it to win maybe a sprig of parsley, maybe an olive branch, maybe a piece of pine wood. And so Paul is saying, these Corinthian athletes, they are living a, a, a temperate, balanced, self-controlled life that they may, may win a crown that's going to pass away. When they had the great final events of the Olympic Games, 40,000 people would descend, Right? It sounds like world rugby next year, doesn't it? 40,000 people would descend. And the person who won the race was crowned with honor and glory and fame. He was looked upon like as a Greek idol. That's why they ran. But here it says that we as Christians who are running the race of life, doing what God has guided us to do and walking in the footsteps of Jesus day by day and living a life of faith, we are going to win an incorruptible crown, a crown that will never pass away, a crown of glory. That's why the Bible says in James 1 and verse 12, blessed is the man, blessed is the person who endureth temptation for when he is tried, he will receive a crown of life. So if you're the richest man in the world, and you don't have Christ, you'll die a pauper. If you have all the adulation of all the crowds that go to watch all these rugby players, and you die without faith and trust in God, you have missed in the great race of life. And Jesus said in that great day, there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth because they've missed. Missed the whole point of their being on planet Earth of knowing uh, 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 blessings and, and having the opportunity of choice. So every day for you and I, as we focus, right, on the privilege of being a Christian and focus on the glories of the kingdom of God, every day is a day of choice. Every day is a Tuesday, right? Not a Tuesday, but a Tuesday. As we plan to prepare for, for the coming of the Lord and for eternity. Verse 26, he says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so I, I fight, not as one that beateth the air. He says, life is real to me. As Longfellow said, life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Never forget those words, right? Isn't that a great statement? W.H. Longfellow, 
Life is real. Life is earnest. And the grave is not its goal. The glory of the kingdom is, is the goal for the Christian. So he says, therefore, this is like a conclusion. Therefore, I am running the great race of life. I'm living to glorify God. I'm living to please God. And I don't do that uncertainly. I don't do it in a fog. I don't do it unclearly. He says, I am focused. I know whom I have believed. I know who, who God is. I know the coming of the Lord. Therefore, I run, not as uncertainly. Therefore, I box. So he's using the language of a boxer. Because in some of these Olympic games, the boxers were famous, right? And he says, I'm training for the kingdom of God. I'm earnest. I'm sincere. I'm not a shadow boxer. Some of us remember Lofty Blomfield and these famous people, right? But we're, we're not playing games. We're not killing time. We have an appointment to meet God one day. And heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Don't you forget that. So he says here, I'm, I'm not as one beating the air. He said, I bruise my body. I give myself a black eye. I keep my body under control. I don't let my body dictate my actions. I use my mind. I keep my body under. I bring it in subjection. I bring even my thoughts into subjection, he says. Because this is important. Because Paul tells these former pagan worshippers who used to go to pagan temples where they had pagan prostitutes, he's telling them, don't you know that your body is a gift of God? Don't you know that your body is a temple of God? That you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God? Hmm. You appreciate these bodies? Now I want to tell you, you and I have enemies. The devil tried to destroy Jesus, right? In the temptation. And the devil will try to tempt you and me every day to swerve away from running, running this race. Being focused, but looking unto Jesus, right? Every day. But I want to tell you a real enemy. You meet him every morning when you get up. You look in the mirror. That is, that is enemy one, number one. Unless you're surrendered to the claims of Christ. That, you know, we, we want to please ourselves. We want to do our thing. We want to make choices that please us. But how many of us living to please God? How many of us living to be a blessing? And so Paul says, I, I keep my bod <coughs> body under. Lest by any means, having preached and proclaimed to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now, in this winter, these Winter Olympics in Vancouver, there were athletes who were disqualified. There was a group from Korea disqualified. There was a group from the Netherlands disqualified. Disqualified because the coach misdirected that young athlete into the wrong track. Now, we uh, have a brother, Lloyd. Some of you know this brother, Lloyd. He used to love running, too. And they had the school sports day at our school. And he was determined that he was going to win. But as he was running this race, someone else edged ahead of him. So he reached over and pulled him back. So they started the race all over again. And the race director said, Lloyd Ellis, don't you do that. If you do that once more, you're out of this race. So Lloyd determined he's going to win. But the same thing happened. And this other fellow edged ahead of him. He reached forward and he pulled him back. He thought he won the race, but he was disqualified. And Paul is saying here, we are running this great race of life. We've got to be very careful that we're doing it to glorify God. Whether we eat or drink, whatever we do, we do all to glorify God. So that we will not be disqualified in that great day. So what are we to do? Over here in the book of Hebrews, this wonderful book of Hebrews, 
I want you to read one or two verses uh, w- with me. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 2 first of all. This is, this is awesome, right? Hebrews chapter 2. And Paul was writing this to Hebrew Christians evidently. And uh, many of these Christians had started the Christian race, but they were turning back to the forms and ceremonies of Judaism. They were slipping away. So Paul writes here, in verse 1, chapter 2, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip out of our hands, lest they drift away. Don't go drifting, right? That fellow, uh, just as we came to New Zealand in his great yacht towards uh, Chatham Islands, he drifted in a storm or something, and we don't know, right? But he lost his life. And Paul is saying here, the writer is saying here, he's giving encouragement to these uh, 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 Christians. He says, don't let these things slip away. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just a recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so sal- greater salvation? How can we win the race of life if we neglect Jesus? Or, or if we give up? Then he says this, verse 9, but we see Jesus, right? Who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for everyone. Isn't that a beautiful statement? Jesus left the glory of heavens, came to the sin-cursed earth, suffered abuse, shame, rejection, scoffing, mocking, and even death, that he might, as the, as the Savior of the world, open the gates of heaven and forgive, give us forgiveness of sins and then a place in the kingdom of God. It says here in verse 10, For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons into glory. What were you born for? You were born to know God, to love God, and to enjoy Him forever. That's the purpose of your creation. That's why we're here on planet Earth. We're here to please God, to honor Him, and then to go and enjoy eternal glory in the kingdom of God, that we might be winners. Now, in Hebrews chapter 11, you know we've got the testimony here of many great winners talks about Noah, talks about Abel, talks about Moses, right? And the choice Moses made. He rejected all the treasures of Egypt. He rejected the pleasures of sin. Most people today are choosing the pleasures of sin. And uh, he's saying uh, about about these wonderful, wonderful uh, men and women of ancient times. In chapter 12, he says here, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Since we are surrounded with these great men and women of ancient times who saw the glory of the Lord, who believed in the promises of God, who who knew that God had a purpose and a plan, eternal plan for them. He said, since we are surrounded with these great champions, these great winners, the true winners, he says, let us lay aside every weight And the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is before us. So in ancient times, even modern times, I see uh, my son was uh, quite a runner. And uh, there would be people training around Vancouver. And they would have weights on their feet and weights on their arms. I thought, that was crazy. It's hard enough to run without putting weights on your arms. On your arms and weights on your feet. But that's evidently what they did. And, 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 the, and the writer here is saying, discard these things that are going to upset you or separate you from God's love. Discard the sin that's going to trip you up. The sin that's going to tempt you to disobey God. Throw them away and let us run with dedication, with patience, with consistency, with commitment, this great race that God has got laid out for each one of us. Now, I want to tell you, in this wonderful book, you can write this down, right? There are 7,487 promises that the God of the universe, through Jesus, makes to you if you put your trust and live the life of faith and become an overcomer. 
Jesus said, he that overcometh shall sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and I sat down with my father in his throne. They are the winners. Of the thousands of athletes that came to Vancouver, most of them came there to win gold. The majority left disappointed and disheartened because they didn't win. This is telling us that each one of us, right, as we love God and walk with God and fulfill the plans and purposes God has for us, we can have an abundant entrance into his kingdom and that will be true winning in God's sight that we might be part of God's everlasting kingdom. So, I want you to look in the Bible as we close this morning. And I want you to look at the, a preview of the great winners of history. And here it is, Revelation 15, Revelation 15, and verse 2. Here's a picture, and I wonder if you, I wonder if you can fit into this picture. It says here, and I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had won, right? Them that got the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Here's a preview of the redeemed of all ages. And they gained the victory. Not only in their own strength, but looking unto Jesus day by day, the author and completer of their faith. Living a life to glorify God, to please God. Having put their hand to the plow, they're not turning back, like Lot's wife did. Having begun the Christian life, they're not going to be dropouts. But they're determined every day to honor and glorify God and to please Him. And here's the picture. And do you know what they're doing in heaven? There's a picture. They're singing. Can you imagine? They're singing, to God be the glory, great things He has done. So loved He the world that He gave His Son for me. They've believed it. They've followed it. And by the way, as I drove around Vancouver, they had a sign over and over again regarding the Olympics. And it was the word believe. 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 And do you know what they wanted us all to believe? That Canada could win many, many goals. Believe. The Bible says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You will win gold. You will be a son and a daughter of God forever and ever. So here is this picture. And there's, there's, then there's this picture here in Revelation chapter 19. Here they are. And may you be amongst this, this number because you believe in Jesus. You've been redeemed. You love God and you walk with him. But here it is in Revelation chapter 19. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude. New Zealanders, Australians, Africans. People from China, people from India, a great multitude, a vast multitude, which no man could number. And as the voice of many waters and the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage supper of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. Wow. Will you sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for you? Will you sing it with the saints in glory? That's a decision you and I make by God's grace every day. We don't look to ourselves, as Claire would say. We look to Jesus. Unto him that is able to keep you from stumbling and becoming a spiritual dropout and losing the crown of glory. You can be a winner. You can be an overcomer. You can be a member of God's everlasting kingdom. Now, on February 28, on February 28, that was a day that many Canadians will never forget because they had this, uh, Canadians go crazy on ice hockey. Do you know that ice, do you know ice hockey? <laughs> okay, doesn't compare to some other games. But any case, any case, ice hockey, and you remember that on February the 28th, as the Olympic Games were closing, at the last few seconds, it looked like the United States were going to defeat Canada. 
when at the last closing moments of the game, a young man born in Nova Scotia got the puck and flicked it in and all Canada went crazy over a little puck. Talk about true values. <laughs> so, my wife and I said, and I hadn't been down to Vancouver for a while, I said, you know, I want to savour what a city that has just won a great game, and particularly a city that's won, a country that's won many gold, I want to savour the enthusiasm, the ecstatic uh, fervour of, of a country that's hosted the 21st Olympics. So we got on SkyTrain, I couldn't believe it. The people on the SkyTrain were singing, they were waving flags, they are talking to me as if I was a young buddy, you know? Uh, everybody was carried away. And we get down into the city there and stop at one place and thousands and thousands of people go off the train, go up to the city where the big celebrations are. My wife and I decide we're going to walk around Canada Place. And there are thousands and thousands of people. The cars were hooting. Great flags were waving. And I, I felt the fervor, the enthusiasm uh, of, of this country carried away. It's all gone now. It's all over. If you are going to be faithful to the Lord, unto him that loved us and gave himself and died for us, if you make that commitment to focus on Jesus, you are going to enjoy the wonders, the glory, the fervor of heaven forever and ever and ever and ever. The world passeth away and the lust, the desires thereof, but he that doeth the will of God will live forever. What are your plans? Get a bigger farm? Grow more kiwi fruit? What are your plans? You're going to leave it all behind one day. What does a prophet of man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Septimius was one of the greatest emperors of the Roman Empire. He conquered many lands. He married possibly the most beautiful woman in the world. He had many, many uh, privileges and opportunities and great power and lots of money. But he had been up fighting the Scots and he came down into England and he was dying in the city of York, in Yorkshire. And as he was dying, he told one of his, some of his men, he says, I have seen everything. I've had everything. I've enjoyed everything. But in this moment of dying, it is worth nothing. Wow. How will it be when your last day comes? Will you be able to say with Apostle Paul, I have fought a good fight. I have struggled. I have honored God. I have walked with God. I've endured his grace. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord himself will give me in that day. Looking unto Jesus every day. Trusting him. Running with purpose and plan. Making decisions that glorify and honor God. And you will have the privilege of being with the redeemed. And the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with everlasting joy upon their heads. Sorrow and sadness will flee away. And those who dwell in that land of fadeless day will sing forever to God. Be the glory. Magnificent things he has done. The Lord bless you, keep you. And guide you, keep you in his love. And may we have the joy in that golden day, each one of receiving a crown of life that will never, never pass away. Thank you.
Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we pause in thy presence and would be still and know that thou art God, art God and God alone. All the blessings we receive come from your infinite heart of love. You've been with us in times of gladness and times of sadness. But Lord, your grace is sufficient for every day, for every challenge. Help us having put our hand in the hand of Jesus every day to choose to honor and to love him and to please him and gladly to do his will, not to be saved, but because, Lord, he has saved us with an everlasting salvation. Bless everybody gathered here today. Teach us to number our days and to apply our hearts unto wisdom. Help us to seek first the kingdom of God. Help us, Lord, not to look what people are doing, but to look at what your promises says that you will do if we trust you and love you. Live out your life within us, Lord. Continue to be with a fountain of life. Search us and know our hearts and see if there be any wicked way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. Bless us as we go on our homeward way. Make us a blessing. Help us to be an influence in society that we may touch other lives and other people too will want to receive that crown of life and the privilege of everlasting joy in an everlasting kingdom of eternal day. Be with us now and we thank you for your grace, your mercy and your presence in the wonderful name which is above every other name, the name of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen.